Welcome everyone to Knowledge at Wharton for this discussion of the European debt crisis. With us today we have two Wharton professors, Franklin Allen, a finance professor, and Mauro Guillen, who is a management professor. Thanks for joining us this morning. Happy to be here. Thank you. Europe has become a financial soap opera. Every week there's a new plan or a plan to have a plan to, to rescue uh, the, the economies from what is a, a very deep debt crisis or potential debt crisis. And one of the questions that seems obvious is, how did they get to this point? But more generally, Mauro, how can such a small economy as Greece create such huge global, continental and global economic problems? Yeah, so you alluded to the issue of governance. And of course, uh, this is a, a big problem in a place where part of the world where you have 27 countries sitting at the table and uh, even very tiny countries can actually cause a lot of trouble in terms of uh, reaching a decision. But more directly to your question about, uh, about Greece, I guess it's all about the interconnections and it's all about the fact that uh, the uh, currency, the uh, common currency was launched um, you know, a little bit more than uh, 10 years uh, ago and um, uh, the stakes are very high uh, because obviously contagion could spread to uh, you know, other parts of Europe, especially to slightly larger economies in the southern periphery like uh, Spain and, and Italy. And so it is a big deal uh, what's going on in Greece, even though the economy is relatively small. Uh, it's also a big deal because uh, it has the potential of affecting banks in other parts of Europe. That's the other important issue here, which is that uh, some of the biggest holders of these government bonds in Europe are banks, domestic banks and banks from other European countries. And so the, uh, the systemic, you know, um, consequences of uh, not fixing the problems in the, really the three countries that have gotten into trouble so far, deep into trouble, uh, Greece, Portugal, and Ireland, can have uh, very wide uh, implications, not only for Europe, but also for the rest of the global economy. So th there's, oh, please. I, I agree with everything that Morris said. I, I, I also think that the, the policymakers made a fundamental mistake back in, May of 2010. They should have let Greece default. At that stage, it was a manageable problem. The banks would have had a problem in Germany and France, but the governments would have been on top of it. They could have afforded to deal with it. And they didn't. They, they made the wrong judgment that this was a small episode that could be contained. And then a few years from now, when things were growing again and everything was fine, they could deal with, with Greece. But what's in fact happened is it's spread. And, and, and the real problem is it's not so much the three that have already gone. It's now Italy. Spain is along the way, but I, I think Spain is a much, much more hopeful case. But it's really that it's the problems in Italy now that are the problem. So it's interesting that um, I, people understand the interconnectedness idea. People tend to understand the contagion idea. Um, but could you just focus for a moment on the idea that, I mean, Greece is a small economy, and why couldn't that wound be cauterized in some way, just, just fixed up, which is, I believe what you're saying, could have happened last May. That opportunity passed. What changed? What events made it so that you couldn't contain it to Greece, which would, for people who don't follow it closely, it would seem like a, a doable thing. It's a small economy. Let's throw some money at it and, and make this problem go away. Yeah, I mean, essentially what you have is, so, so, so countries in many parts of the world, but this is certainly the case in Europe, are, um, you know, governments are deeply into debt. And of course, the maturities of the debts are different, right? And so you get to a point in which, uh, you know, the markets just don't want to give more money for some of these countries to uh, roll over their debts at an interest rate that is reasonable, right? And uh, this is happening, of course, also in the midst of a recession. So everybody's under pressure, government's under pressure, tax revenue is down, and you have all of these problems all at once. And as Franklin just noted, um, you know, you can always bail out countries, right? Uh, but that, of course, always has many problems in the sense that, well, you have to persuade the uh, people who are going to put the money on the table that that's a, a good thing to do. And you don't want the countries that are bailed out to think that, that they're always going to be bailed out, right? So it has those problems. The moral hazard. Exactly, sure. exactly. And then on top of that, there is the issue, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, banks are, of course, up to their throats in terms of these uh, bonds. So frankly, I think it's correct in saying that um, a little bit over a year ago, we could have said, let's uh, you know, uh, offer the Greeks a, a deal, right? So you have to return only whatever, 60 cents on the euro or 50 cents on the euro. And some European banks, French and German for the most part, would have a little bit more, more trouble. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, if, 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 if it were circumscribed to just the Greek banks, then we could, uh, the Greek uh, debt, then we could have dealt with that, right? Another matter, of course, is the Greek banks, which also own a lot of um, Greek government debt. But we could have done that, right? Instead, we've gone the other route. And then, of course, the troubles have multiplied along the way, right? And essentially, we find ourselves now in a situation in which everybody has doubts in Europe and outside of Europe as to what is the correct course of action. But our past decisions over the last uh, couple of years or so are placing a lot of constraints on what can be done. And then, of course, the politicians in Europe are just you know, not agreeing to anything. The latest summit uh, has, uh, I think, demonstrated that uh, once again. And um, the longer, of course, the problem persists, the more tensions and the more frictions and uh, the markets, of course, are deeply unsettled because they see that there's no end to the, uh, to the saga right, that you described at the beginning of uh, summits that uh, lead to uh, nowhere and uh, no big decision is made. The, uh, my, my view of the problem is there's now no easy solution because each of the possible solutions are ruled out. So one solution is to print money. The ECB could go out, buy up two trillion euros of debt, much the same way the Fed did in the US and that would probably contain it. Because of the history of Germany and the 1923 Weimar inflation, they're dead set against that. It's, it, it's it, in the Treaty of Maastricht, they can't do it. It's built into the ECB that they shouldn't do it. Because they think it's going to be inflationary, which goes back to, to the 20s or 30s? Yeah, so th their view of central banking is central banks are there to fight inflation. If they take any kind of unorthodox action, then there's a risk of something like 1923 or maybe a, a, not as extreme as that, but something like that in that direction may occur. So that's ruled out. Another version is that they come together as one European zone and they have a joint fiscal system and they have a Eurozone bond. But the problem for that is that m most countries are not ready for that kind of integration at this stage. They simply don't have the political institutions they need to control that. And g a good example of that is that when Germany and France violated the Growth and Stability Pact, they made sure that nobody was penalized, the French and the Germans themselves. So they themselves put it to an end, the notion that these, these kinds of mechanisms could work. And then what they're trying to do is, is to go between all these different alternatives which don't have enough money to them. So what's happening at the moment is this financial engineering which makes what happened in the US in the subprime mortgage or or, or any of those events look, look tame by comparison. They're making it so complicated, it seems. You know, we, we don't have the final details, but the leaks seem to make it so complicated that it's very difficult to see how it's going to play out in the next few days. Yeah, yeah you're referring to the um, uh, fund that they're putting together. Yeah, the EFSF. And all of the rules right, what as to how to use it right, yeah. in the future. So, uh, well, whether they're going to go the insurance route and have these 20% guarantees on new issues of Eurozone bonds and then are all lots of illegal issues like how many of the bonds have negative pledge clauses, which means that everybody has to get that. That's one way the French wanted to go the way of having a bank, create the EFSN as a bank with that as capital, and then they would borrow from the ECB, which is a complicated way of printing money, but it's basically going the printing money route. It's going around the treaty, right? Yeah, it's going round, round that. So th that, that's the problem. We've got into such a complicated situation because of these restrictions on, on the different sides. And uh, the, the final one, which is the German constitution is quite clear that they don't want a transfer of sovereignty, which any of these other issues would involve. And so you know, now Angela Merkel has to go back to the Bundestag. They're going to have a full vote in the Bundestag after they've come up with a deal. And we'll see whether they go for that or not. So we have suddenly gone from Greece having a few problems to talk of, I mean, the latest that I see is a $1.4 trillion facility, potentially, which already people are saying that's still not enough, which is what, what you were talking about. So just to go back to root causes for a moment, Greece got into trouble because the government overspent and or it was not <coughs> very good at collecting 
revenues. <laughs> Is that right? I mean, just not to oversimplify, but how did Greece get into trouble? Well, they lied, basically. <laughs> so their statistics department didn't keep track of what the, the national debt was. They and cooked the books? They cooked the books. And uh, they suddenly, when they had a change of government, realized they had much more debt than, than they had previously thought. And I think if anybody had really understood on the outside that these debt levels were, in fact, where they were, we would have seen a very different trajectory because people would have stopped lending a lot sooner. How does that happen? How does any country which is in international borrowing markets at some level, what, is that correct? I mean, they're taking on sovereign debt. Someone's lending that money to them through bonds. Presumably, people are doing due diligence. Presumably, these are smart people. Presumably, they can, they, they, they can read the books of Greece. Um, but they didn't, or they couldn't. So, what? How did that? Go well, for wrong? me, that's one of the um, um, you know great questions about the last uh, ten years or so. Uh, and uh, I personally can't think of any other answer than that the uh, the lenders were perhaps too willing to lend to countries like Greece, Portugal, Ireland. Remember that the assumption was that the euro was there to stay, so there was no currency risk, right? Uh, and um, the, uh, the yield uh, was not as high as it is today, obviously, right, relative to the German um, uh, bond. But uh, it was above the German bond, right? There was a little bit of a, uh, of a premium there. So, you know, people, you know, interest rates were very low right around the world. Uh, Franklin has, uh, you know, studied that very well. And uh, so there was very few places where you could get a, what they thought was a risk-free, you know, uh, investment, right, that paid, you know, much, much better, right? Uh, than the German bond, right? And so, or the or U.S. Treasury bills, for that matter. And so, people flock to investors flock to um, to Greece and to uh, to buy, you know, Greek uh, bonds and uh, Irish bonds and uh, Portuguese bonds because they were a reasonably good investment. And the assumption was it was safe. And of course, now we realize that it wasn't as safe as people thought, right? Uh, you want to add to that? I, I think there's a, there's a very important technical issue, which is how did the Greek statistics agency have so much political interference that something like this could happen. Because in most countries, if anything like that happened, many people would have gone to jail. I don't think that no. that's happened in Greece. <laughs> and I think that this is a big part of the difference in the institutions between Northern and Southern Europe, which is at the heart of the problem between politically, because Southern Europeans, and I think Spain is very different here, but particularly in Greece and Italy, there's a social compact of some kind that the rich don't pay taxes. They have very high tax rates, but it's okay to lie and cheat and have multiple systems whereby, you know, if you go to Italy and you go to the doctors, there's two prices you can pay. You can pay the price where they pay taxes or they can pay the back market in cash. And that's, that is at the heart of the problem. As I say, I think Spain is very different after the... Maybe a little bit, but, 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 but it is a general problem. And this speaks, of course, very powerfully to the issue of North versus South and economies in Europe that continue to be very competitive, right, uh, globally. And, you know, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Austria, and so on. And then economies on the Mediterranean rim that, uh, you know, essentially have lost competitiveness and they weren't that competitive to begin with. And so you're a member of the uh, rich club, right? Uh, but uh, your productivity and uh, your competitiveness, external competitiveness, doesn't really qualify you as a member of that club. So the euro was built on a series of assumptions, right? There was the problem with the uh, lack of fiscal unity. But it's also this assumption that, oh, everybody's going to uh, you know, be able to move in the same direction, becoming more competitive, more productive, and so on and so forth. And this really hasn't happened. Uh, so I think there is a, an increasingly wide, you know, a wide gap between the North and the South. Uh, it goes all the way back to also the quality of institutions. Yeah. Absolutely. So there was a fundamental difference that was going to inevitably make it difficult to Absolutely. try to bolt Absolutely. these two Absolutely. regions together. And a good example of this is that the, the Greek finance minister a few weeks ago said they were going to publish a list of the 
people who haven't been paying their taxes properly. <laughs> now, first of all, that, that's never actually come about as far as I know yet. But, but most importantly of all, in most countries, these people would be going to jail. <laughs> they wouldn't be having their name in the newspaper. <laughs> Absolutely. The other, the other thing to uh, keep in mind here, and there was uh, recently in the press a chart on this, is that uh, over the last 10 years, since the introduction of the euro, uh, you know, Germany, which was a little bit scared about the consequences of all of this, and uh, remember in the 1990s they had trouble uh, with their competitiveness, right? They were losing ground because they were burdened by the uh, union uh, with uh, East Germany and so on and so forth. They, you know, it was actually the Social Democrats. It was a left-leaning, pro-labor kind of government. Uh, uh, Schroeder was the, cha the chancellor who actually um, introduced uh, very important reforms try to keep costs in Germany down so that the German manufacturing economy in particular would still be competitive. And you see that over the last 10 years, manufacturing costs in Germany have been pretty much flat, right? Whereas in Greece, Portugal, Spain, Ireland, they have increased by 35 to 40 percent over uh, 10 years. Uh, so it's not only that Germany already was more competitive than these other countries, it's that it has become even more so over the last 10 years. That's the problem, right? Uh, long term, I think that's a big, big problem. In addition to the short term, you know, financial issues and debt issues that, uh, that the continent is, is suffering from. So just to go back to the fundamentals again for a moment, we've got Greece cooking the books uh, with uh, various bureaucrats being complicit, however, however they pulled that off. So you in effect have a country doing liar loans <laughs> the way we had mortgages in the U.S. They were just accepting people with no income said they had an income and these were accepted and, and, and rolled up into securities that were sold. Um, but even given that, let's say, there was rot at, at the center of the Greek Statistical Bureau, there's still, it's still hard to understand, uh, if you're not watching closely, how that could lead to the kinds of problems we have today. And, it seems that in order for that to happen, one has to understand that, that there's a weakness in the European banking system generally that allows something like Greece's problems to spread quickly to all those banks. In other words, it's not just that they're interconnected, is it? Is it also that, they're, that they aren't so liquid and maybe some of them are even insolvent if they were to mark down um, all of their liabilities to, to, to market value? So, so you've got the Greek problem, but isn't it also that there's a huge weakness throughout many European banks that allows this smaller problem to spread uh, so quickly and uh, deeply? Uh, as Mauro was alluding at the beginning, th there are lots of problems. This is not just Greece. In, in Ireland, they had a massive property bubble. In Spain, they had a property bubble. Portugal, they didn't, but they had a, a very slow growth, lack of competitiveness problem. And then Italy is, is the big problem, and that's the one that you can't save. And they basically have a, a political problem, which is Berlusconi has now, what, three or three major cases against him, which range from paying an underage prostitute to have sex, to corrupting his lawyer, to all these kinds of things where they can't remove him. So that when they have a, a, a problem like they're having now, which is they need to credibly show that when there's a shock, they can go out and raise taxes and, and get rid of a deficit so that the, the, the debt doesn't get out of control. And they can't do that. And so that's their basic problem, in my view. And we see that over the weekend with Sarkozy and Merkel, both pointedly pressurizing Berlusconi to do something. And, their, their political system can't respond. So I think that, that's a big part of the problem. On the banking side, a large part of the issue is that the Basel agreements and all banking regulation says the debt of OECD countries is risk-free. Right. And even though we know that that's not true, it, they're just about to default, whatever, whatever you, however one puts it in Greece, there's still this fantasy there. So they are not they're not accepting their reality on the ground. And it, this is, you know, we had last year in the summer 
the European Banking Authority did the stress test. The Irish banks got wonderful scores, fine, no problems. A few weeks later, they have to put in 32% of Irish GDP into the banks to recapitalize them. You'd think that they would learn that it's not a good idea to fix these tests, but we went through the same thing this year. They do the, the, they do the stress test. Dexia gets a wonderful score because it's got mostly sovereign debt. And it went bust. And it just had to be bailed out. And, and this is the problem. Now they've redone it. You know, we went from Christine Lagarde, who was the French finance minister at the beginning of July, who knew everything about the French banks, I presume. She then moves to the IMF six weeks later. She's making a speech in Jackson Hole that the European banks are undercapitalized. All the European leaders are going, no, no, they're not. Then a few weeks later, oh, yes, they are, but we need 100. The IMF's still saying 200 billion. But it's this denial. So in the current round of stress tests, which they redid after Dexia, they just did the sovereign debt haircuts. They didn't look at any adverse macroeconomic stress. So they're still engaged in this complete game Fiction. of denial. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, did, would you like to add something? You were about no, to no, no, no. I mean, the only thing perhaps to add is that on top of all of that, uh, as you know, deposit institutions, most banking, in banks in Europe are deposit institutions, right? I mean, they may do investment banking, but they're deposit institutions. And as such, uh, you know, they need to um, hold reserves in cash or uh, securities. And uh, of course, uh, you know, they would prefer to hold them in securities that pay money. And again, the Greek debt was paying you know, a reasonable interest rate, right, at a time when uh, other, you know, safe investments were very difficult to, uh, to find. And uh, so, 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 so again, I mean, uh, the banks themselves were also, you know, fools in the sense of uh, thinking, right, that they could park all of that money in something that was safe, right? And of course, the regulators, you know, the, the central banks were asking them to hold that money in things that presumably were safe, and that included uh, Greek bonds, right? So. Uh, what I think we're both trying to say is that uh, the whole way of thinking, right, uh, the mindset, right, uh, needs to change, right? Uh, so there are practical kinds of things that need to change, but it's also the whole mindset, right, that, that well, like Greek government bond is not the same as a German bond, and still OECD, you know, and national regulators were treating it for the last 10 years as if it were essentially the same thing, right? And that, uh, obviously, is, is pure fiction. Well, that's interesting. What would have to change? What, what kind of cultural and economic and financial thinking would have to change? How would it have to change in order to get to a more sustainable place? Uh, well, I think all of the above, right? <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> all of the things it's that... All order. But uh, I guess the, uh, the most important thing is, um, from my point of view, or one place to begin is you know, to recognize that, I mean, because of the, the, the currency, because of the uh, uh, authority that issues them, because of the, uh, the track record of that authority, different asset classes and different bonds and different, uh, have different levels of risk, right? And I don't think the system that we have in place, which of course includes all sorts of participants, it includes private actors, it includes governments, it includes uh, rating agencies, it includes everybody, they've come to a situation in which they can truly assess that risk with, you know, in a way that uh, they can provide to the markets, they can provide to everybody information about the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the quality of those, you know, bonds and assets in general in a way that then decision makers can do their job, right? I think we're not there. Uh, that, by the way, I think is also a problem here in the United States, right? But it's just, uh, it's too confusing. And we still haven't figured out exactly what are the consequences from the last three years or four years as to how, you know, we need, what we need to change, not, not only in terms of regulation, but also in terms of thinking about, you know, risk and how to think about these different asset classes. Uh, but uh, frankly, you, you know far more about this. No, but no. That's my, uh, but that's my take on it, right? That we haven't really, put our arms around the issue of how to price risk and how to think about risk. Right? I think you're exactly right, Mara. I, I think it's a very complicated risk because with sovereign debt, if you can go out and raise taxes or cut expenditure when you have a shock, then the sovereign debt is quite safe. So end of the Napoleonic Wars, UK had about 250% of GDP in debt, having fought wars for, for many, many years against Napoleon. 
And they were able to deal with that quite well because people knew that whenever there would be an issue, they would just simply go out and do what, whatever was needed. They would do and the political classes would come behind them. They wouldn't have a fight. And I think you know, one of the interesting countries in this whole episode is the UK because they're really the only country which has sat down in a serious way and said, where are we? What have we got to do to make things work? And they came up with a very austere plan. They raised taxes. They've done lots of things. If you compare that with what's happening in France, for example, France is in trouble at the moment because there's a real issue about whether if they have a shock, they can actually go out and raise taxes. So we, we, you know, Sarkozy wanted to put in the debt break on the Constitution. Well, he couldn't do that because he lost the majority in the Senate. They wanted to have tax rises to increase the, or to reduce the deficit and increase their viability. One of the things they, they suggested was increasing taxes on theme parks. Right. Turns out one of the ministers has Asterix the Gaul theme park in his constituency, so immediately that got pushed back and within, within hours almost. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, we see the same thing in Italy. The, the Draghi and, um, and Trichet write the letter making it conditional to buy the bonds as long as the Italian government came through. So Tremonti came up with a fairly sensible package over the first weekend. Well, by the time 10 days had passed, there'd been so much pushback that that had basically gone down to, well, we're going to do, do away with tax evasion. And then they had to go through the same thing the night before with, with the central bank calling them up and saying, don't do it. And now we're going through it again <laughs> with Merkel and Sarkozy. Yeah, there's one thing that I would like to add more from a uh, kind of political perspective here, which is that I think there's two other very important deficits in Europe right now. One is there's a deficit in terms of the politicians and uh, how they're handling themselves, right? So they're not really exercising the kind of leadership that uh, one would want, right? And uh, Franklin just mentioned three or four examples of how they propose something and then they, they look at the political costs and then they, they, you know, they back down from that. And then the second one, I think, is public opinion. Uh, you see, Europe is, you know, in spite of all of these troubles, is a part of the world where people live well. Right? Standards of living are relatively high. And of course, some people are suffering, especially those who are unemployed. But even those, uh, because in Europe, the family plays such an important role in terms of helping you know, when somebody in the, in the family is unemployed. And, and there's you know, a strong, strong social safety net. And there's a strong safe social safety net. You know, so there's the welfare state, and there's also the family networks, and so on and so forth. So I think you know, in Europe, the politicians don't feel the, uh, the urge to actually take radical action. Uh, or the kind of radical action that I think the situation, you know, would require. Uh, because there's no pressure, really, from public opinion, right? And public opinion, there's a lot of inertia. They don't want anything radical. And at the end of the day, uh, the problems, at least uh, as felt by people, right, ordinary people, are not that big. People can still eat, and they can go to the movies, and they can enjoy life. Uh, now, of course, this could, you know, if, if the problem persists, Europe could go into a situation in which there's actually a big problem, right? Much bigger than what we have now, for example, if the banking system in one or more of these countries collapses. And uh, uh, so uh, I think, you know, things are not good, but things are not as catastrophic as, you know, they, they could be. We're somewhere in between, so the politicians are not very motivated, you know, to act. And public opinion itself, you see, there are no major riots, right? other than the occasional one in Greece because they dislike, you know, the next round of measures. And then, of course, the, the, the austerity measures get watered down. So it's kind of this, uh, you know, no man's land. Uh, you're somewhere in between where there's not enough, not enough bad things are happening so that then, you know, people feel, well, we need to really, you know, uh, tackle the, the situation and, uh, and, and overcome the problems. Easier uh, to kick the can down the road. To exactly. Use the there's there's worn a lot of that going on. I agree with you exactly, Mauro. I, I think it's the politicians don't quite understand what the downside is. So there are many scenarios. For example, Greece decides to leave the Eurozone because the, the group that is being hurt very badly is the youth in Greece. And they, that's a lost generation. And at some point, they'd be much better off to go the Argentina route. But as soon as they do that, as soon as they leave this Eurozone, 
then people in Italy are suddenly going to realize that their money can halve in value overnight. Right. And then there's going to be massive capital flight to Northern Europe and have to put in capital controls. But then we have a real risk of the banking system in Europe really coming under pressure. And they don't have the fiscal resources to deal with it. So this is a, a catastrophic kind of event, which you know is of 1930s proportions. And we seem to be moving towards it because they're not willing to take the, 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 the measures that they need to to prevent that. And this is what, for me, is so scary about the situation. Uh, so is there a way for Greece to withdraw, say, temporarily from the Eurozone to get its house in order um, under a plan that would include them rejoining at some point later um, that could be managed in an orderly way without the contagion and panic that you just described? Well, there's two, there's two scenarios, which is what the politicians are calling the orderly default, and the, then there's the disorderly default. So uh, let me just finish off on the disorderly default. So Friday night comes, the markets close in the US, Greece passes a law late at night that one euro equals one drachma in all domestic law contracts. Now, they're going to have to fight lots of lawsuits and so on, but basically, they'll probably win those. And then, since 80% or around that of their sovereign debt is domestic law, and I presume most of their commercial contracts and the, the debt with the banks is that, they'll effectively lower the debt burden significantly, and they'll start growing because you can go on holiday to Greece now for half the price than to Spain or Italy or France. So, so they'll be fine, but there'll be this catastrophe in the rest of Europe. The other way is that the EU, the ECB, the French, the Germans essentially, because they're running everything at the moment, would come up with a negotiated solution about how much the Greek debt is written down. And the Greeks are, are doing a wonderful job of in my view, of negotiating, that they get more of a write down because they have this option of going outside and causing havoc for the rest of, of, of Europe. Well, everyone seemed to agree that the write down, or the haircut as they call it, would be 21% back in July. There was an agreement, it was signed in blood, and suddenly we're talking about 60%. Well, the first thing is you have to be very careful about these numbers because they depend a lot about what the discount rates are and so on. So Barclays Capital, for example, came up with an analysis which shows it was not 21%, it was actually 5%. And the current one, they keep talking about these numbers and what they mean. I don't think we understand, is, is the official sector also going to take that kind of haircut? Is the, is the EU, is the ECB going to take that, or is it just the private banks? They just put this number. If it's just the private sector, 60% is not enough, in my view. So, uh, In other words, they could offer, I mean, they could rest restructure different um, parts of their debt in different ways, depending on their maturities, also depending on who owns them, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So all of these needs to be discussed. I mean, when you're, now, whether the across the board average, you know, discount or haircut is 60% or 40%, or it depends on, you know, a, a large number of variables. They have this favorite tactic, because it is very complicated, yeah. but they, their, their desire is to make things so complicated that most people have no idea what's actually it's being working. said, it's and working. it's working. <laughs> so you have uh, these potential discounts. We, they call it a restructuring. Basically, you're b breaking a contract, but everyone's agreeing to break the contract uh, um, and not call it breaking the contract. Uh, is that right? Well, my own understanding is that it's, it seems unlikely to me that that everybody's going to voluntarily agree. So there was a deadline about four or five weeks ago where they were supposed to get 90% agreement. So the days leading up to that Friday, then suddenly the Greek government started and said, we don't actually need 90%, we need 80%. And then Friday came, and I was waiting for the news the next day, it never came. Th they never got the agreement that they needed to, to do that. And if you're a, a Dutch pension fund, for example, my understanding is you have a fiduciary duty to do the best for your pensioners not to, to give away money to, to the 
to whoever the Greeks government. Doesn't don't all of these tactics and change ups and the complication that you're talking about at some point backfire? For example, um, Greece agreed to a twenty one or, or Greek wanted its creditors to agree to a 21% haircut. Greece agreed that if they did that, then, th then Greece would adhere to certain things. You point out it really wasn't 21%. It may have been as low as 5%. But, but whatever. Nominally, it was 21%. That's just a couple of months ago. Now we're talking about nominally 60%. If I'm an owner of Italian bonds, let's say, I'm thinking, wait a second, they agreed to 21%. What if Italy wants me to agree to 21% and I agree to 21% is three weeks later, three months later, it's going to be 60%? Now you're, you've already started the contagion. You've already started the breakdown in confidence. And um, I think it was Martin Wolf in the Financial Times said that the biggest threat right now is the threat of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's, it's, it's the case of a bank that is essentially solvent, but if the rumors are spread wide enough that it's not solvent. There's a run on the bank, and now the bank is not solvent, <laughs> even though um, it, it was a, at the start. So, isn't there this threat, or that, or the risk that that the the very way that they're handling it breaks down confidence to the point that you get exactly the result that you're trying to avoid? Absolutely, you want to contain the problem as quickly as possible, fix that problem before. This is the way we started this conversation before it spreads to other other parts. It would have been better a year and a half ago to uh, address the uh, the Greek problem before uh, you know it spread to uh, to other places around uh, Europe. Uh, this is, I think, something that we can all agree on, right? Uh, it would have been much better to go down that path, but um, the uh, decision makers in Europe. Uh, were not ready to uh, take that step, and they, as frankly noted at the beginning, they took a different path, right? Trying to bail out Greece as opposed to trying to address the root of the problem right there, right? So, um, what what are the potential paths to sustainability here? What are the risks? What is the likelihood that one of those paths, if there's more than one, will be the one that gets taken? Well, my view is they have to be looking over the edge of the cliff and seeing that there is a desperate situation in front of them. And once they do that, then leaders have to step up. So, you know, in Italy, Mario Monti would be a wonderful prime minister in this situation. If he had a government of national unity, he could make the kinds of changes that they need. But the real risk is they fall over the cliff before they get to that point. And these, these crises move so quickly that there's a real risk that they're going to be falling over the cliff. But hopefully, at some point, we will begin to get some leadership. And I think it's really in Italy. You know, Merkel was talking to the president, Napolitano, who's a very widely respected person. But the focus of the crisis is really in Italy. They need to have a change of government. That, that's, that's the one single thing, in my view, that gives us a hope of getting on the sustainable path. Because they, they can be solvent if they simply tax and spend in, in, a, in a reasonable way and start bringing down their debt. The other problems, I think, you know, there countries like Portugal are going to have problems. But these are small countries. It's the big one that's the big problem. I, th I think Spain is manageable, too. Yeah, except that the latest uh, uh, government deficit figures are not uh, wonderful. They have actually exceeded their targets. Uh, but I agree. I mean, it is really the, uh, the bigger economies in the southern periphery that, uh, that we should all be uh, concerned about. Uh, I, I would also like to add just a quick comment about uh, the other side of the economy, so the real economy. Obviously, if, you know, for whatever reason, and I don't know exactly how this could happen in the present context, but GDP figures start to improve in Europe that's going to give everybody a little bit more breathing room. Except that, of course, you never know whether that breathing room, per Franklin's comment, is actually going to tell the politicians or the policymakers, oh, we can actually muddle through this. The right, pressure's without. off, yeah. Right, so, um, you know, I'm of two minds when I, you know, of course I would prefer, for example, the real economy figures to, to improve, but at the same time, if they improve too quickly, <laughs> right, let me put it that way, 
it may actually reduce the, uh, the appetite for, for true reform and for true action on the, on the financial front. So it's a kind of a catch-22, right? I mean, I don't know what to say kind of situation in the sense that uh, I'm hoping for the best. But uh, as Franklin said, I mean, they really need to realize that how close most of these economies are to the cliff, right? And uh, once they come to that realization, then maybe we will start seeing some, some action here. In talking about the real economy or the real economies, uh, you've got what seems to some an inherent contradiction. On the one hand, you've got a potential financial crisis, which is ex exasperated by poor economic performance. And on the other hand, you have government actions in many of these countries um, where austerity measures are, are being enforced or, or, or forced onto countries. Um, how does this idea of expansionary contraction work? I, I'm a little bit confused about how you slow down economic activity in the hopes that you're going to grow out of your problem. I get that the idea is that you cleanse the system somehow and you come out of it stronger, but is this the right time or the wrong time to be trying to cleanse the system in that way? Well, it's not a good place to start out on that <laughs> <laughs> program because you're exactly right. You know, you have this contradiction, which is if you cut government expenditure, it's probably going to slow down the economy and then you, it's going to be much more difficult to grow out of it. But the problem is that if you just go and keep borrowing money and, and hoping that demand will somehow pick up, you run the real risk of running into a wall. A and what I think is, was the big mistake was that governments went to much too high debt levels. I think as soon as you start getting above you may, 40, 50 percent, you've got to start saying, now is the time maybe for us to put our house in order and make sure, because once you get to 70, 80 percent, then you're exactly in this bind. And I think that's one of the big lessons for governments. We need to keep debt much, much lower going forward. Mara, it may be that Spain is the poster child here because Spain, uh, uh, they may have even been in surplus when, when the fiscal, when, when the that is financial true. crisis hit. So no one was running their economy better than Spain in the sense of, of, of uh, being prudent. I don't think their long-term debt was all that high. I don't know exactly where it was, but compared to places like Greece and so forth. Um, and now you just mentioned that uh, the deficit they're not hitting their deficit numbers. Um, so Spain did everything right. They would have been, they would have been the, the picture in the, in the foyer of the IMF if you walked in. Um, and yet they're, they're getting slammed and now they're taking on this austerity and the results seem to be that the economy is going down. So there's, there's two different kinds of countries, countries that had government debt excess, but what about those countries that were actually being run Well, on the surface, you're, I think, correct uh, that, um, you know, the macro picture looked like, uh, you know, pretty good in 2005, 2006, just before the, uh, the storm hit. However, uh, there were some underlying weaknesses, and uh, we uh, fully understood the consequences of that uh, in 08 and 09, right? And I'm talking about Spain. So, you know, a lot of the boom and uh, a lot of the uh, extra revenue that the government was getting that enabled it to actually balance the budget, have a modest surplus. And in 05 and 06, it was actually paying down the, uh, the debt, right? So it was reducing the stock of debt. You know, all of that was built on a uh, chimera, which was that uh, real estate prices would, uh, you know, the real estate boom will con would continue forever. And remember that uh, at the time, um, you know, 13, 14 percent of uh, GDP uh, had to do with uh, new construction, right? And uh, the entire banking system, right, uh, participated in that boom. And now, you know, the most important problems, in fact, have to do with the uh, with the aftermath of the collapse in the uh, in the real estate uh, sector. So, on the surface, you're absolutely correct, and I think many very good decisions were made at the time. But at the same time, the whole thing was predicated on the assumption, right? that uh, there would be no, no problem in the real estate sector and in the construction sector. And so, of course, the day of reckoning came. And even though prices haven't collapsed as much as in other parts of the, uh, of the world, like in the U.S. or other parts of Europe, like Ireland, right, mm -hmm. most notably, it is still, you know, the collapse has been big enough to, 
you know, put everything at risk, including the real economy, including unemployment, of course, which has gone up uh, above uh, 20 percent again. And uh, and uh, so yeah, it was a uh, it was a uh, a great uh, situation, but it was based on clay foundations, not on solid you know foundations. And uh, and we, we're, the country is paying a price right now. It's interesting to see how the root causes differed from country to country. So in Greece, for example, it was government overborrowing and government excess. In Spain, it was actually the banks were overlending. It was actually the the private sector that overdid the lending, and then when the problems blew up, well, they didn't quite blow up in Spain the way they did in Greece, but they're still very serious. Now the government's left to sort of clean up the mess, which is what happened in, in, in other countries also. I think that's what makes it such a complicated problem, because there, it's, it's so, you know, Portugal's another interesting case, because Portugal didn't have a real estate boom. Their the, the real prices have been pretty flat. What happened there was that young people started going to Brazil and Angola and other places which were growing fast and so then Portuguese firms weren't as competitive because all the good people were leaving and they just had very slow growth but they continued to suck in money to have this lifestyle <laughs> and and so that they, they have a difficult problem I would say but it's very different from Spain and Ireland. Yeah, so once one size fits all solution yeah. won't work and then you have 27 countries, of which maybe 15 are in trouble, right? Or perhaps more, uh, of which five are in deep trouble, yeah. right? One of them being Italy, which is the big uh, elephant in the room, right? Everybody wants to know what's, what's going to happen there. And uh, it's complex. Each country is complicated. And then when you, you know, sit down at the table and see, well, we have to address the problems of all of these countries simultaneously. And uh, the, the root causes and the present uh, situation is so different. It is a uh, it is a difficult. Uh so there's a lot of worry that gets expressed around the idea of a country defaulting, and um, clearly, if if Greece were to default or pull out of the euro, it would have the catastrophic consequences potentially that, that we talked about earlier. But you mentioned something interesting, which was the case of Argentina about ten years ago, which had pegged its currency to the dollar, um, and then it got into trouble. And uh, it decided that it wasn't going to pay back its creditors. And everyone talked about what an entire disaster this would be for Argentina. As it turned out, they, after default, they did have a very deep, but it was a very short recession, relatively speaking. And Argentina has actually grown twice as fast as Brazil, which is the poster child for emerging markets, over the last 10 years. Um, so. From Argentina's point of view, it seems to have worked out pretty well. Um, whether or not that's an option for a Greece or some other country uh, is, is an open question. But, but if you're sitting in Greece and you're in charge of things, don't you at least have to look at Argentina and say, am I willing to, am I willing to put my country through a devaluation will, of wages? My that view, just to put it simple, simple, simple terms, is that it would only work if uh, the Chinese suddenly become very fond of olives. <laughs> you see, the reason why Argentina has been doing so great is because the, the most important export commodity is soybeans, right? And there's this huge demand of soybeans in Brazil for cattle feed, but primarily in China. This has really helped them uh, grow that, uh, you know, this fast. Uh, what has also helped them, by the way, is that they have this uh, free trade agreement with Brazil. And as Brazilian inflation has gone up, Argentine made goods have become more competitive, also because the Argentines have a devalued currency, whereas the real has been raising in value. So the Argentines have, this, uh, have had these two things going their way over the last five or six years. One is exports of, uh, raw, mater of uh, raw materials and uh, agricultural commodities to China. And secondly, um, you know, a big booming market in Brazil at a time when Brazilian firms uh, are being you know, uh, hurt by a loss of competitiveness relative to Argentinian firms. right? Uh, but Greece, uh, you know, Franklin mentioned tourism uh, just a few minutes ago. That could be one way for them to uh, pursue the Argentine route, right? But you need to be able to sell something, right, for which there is high demand and rising prices. So again, the analogy could be olives. I doubt, though, that China is going to develop so quickly a taste for olives. And by the way, Greece is not the only olive-producing country in that, the world. That could hurt right? Spain's economy. Though. Right. So, so that's one cute way of putting what the situation. I mean, yeah. I don't think Argentina should be should become the example, right? And there are good reasons why Argentina has done so well, 
that have nothing to do with their economic policies, that have more to do with a favorable uh, global situation f for them, right? But so I, I would take that. a slightly different position. Okay. I think um, <laughs> Argentina has done lots of things that are crazy too. So it would be in some ways difficult to imagine more mismanagement within within the country in terms for the last, of for the last hundred years. For the last yes. hundred years, but yeah. but particularly under the uh, the last ten years, and the counterfactual or the the alternative scenario in Greece is so. Bad. I mean, they're going to shrink now. It's down to minus 5.5 percent this year. Mm. They shrank last year. They're probably going to shrink next year and maybe the year after that. They're going to have all these austerity cuts kicking in even more savagely than they have done. It's probably going to be at least a decade and possibly 15 to 20 years before they get back to where they were at 2006. I, I agree. With what that. politician wants to shoulder that? And, it's, it's, and there's, you know, the, the, the social cost is tremendous. There's a whole generation, maybe two generations, that will never really have proper employment. Greece I is an interesting kind. I had always thought of it as being very, very poor and lagging behind. But actually, today, in terms of GDP per capita, it's, oh. it's a, in PPP, it's about the same as Italy and Spain. So they did grow. I think if you went back 50, 60 years ago, they were significantly poorer than Italy, for example. And they, so they have caught up. So they do, they do have some productive advantages. They're very good in tourism. That could obviously be become very competitive quickly. But they're also one of the leading shippers in the world. I mean, the, the shipping industry, although all the ships are based in the Marshall Islands, most of the services and things are arranged in Greece. And they're, they're very good at that. They're also very good at uh, generic drugs. Apparently, a significant proportion of European generic drugs are produced in, in Greece. And so they do have some advantages. It, it's really the government. It's the private sector is not so bad. It's the government that's terrible. Right, but, but in order to pursue the Argentine route, they would also need to just get out of the euro and also get that uh, that boost from oh no, for sure. Yeah, okay. no, the, so, I, so you're I, assuming. I'm okay. assuming that they do that. Okay, and they, they actually get out of they, the euro. They, they right. get out the door. They get right, rid right, of their right, debt, right. and then okay. you know they get rid of the yes. the debt burden and do that. And I don't. I think I agree with Mauro. It won't be like Argentina. But I think it's probably a lot better than this alternative scenario. So let's talk about another real life example because a lot of times in economics you have to talk in abstracts because you can't conduct catastrophic experiments with countries very often, but sometimes they happen anyway. Iceland's another example. Small country, different than Argentina, however, um, the banks overlent, they got in trouble, um, and they ended up defaulting on their de debt. The government of Iceland. Um, basically said, we're not going to assume the debt of the banks, which is the opposite of what Ireland did. Uh, fast forward to today, Iceland is recovering, their employment is up. In other words, they suffered much less than Ireland has, which has gone by the book and has had, uh, I, I think GDP there dropped by 14% at one point. Um, and, um, I know some, some of the numbers in Ireland look a little bit better more lately, but I've also read that, 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 that that's a temporary blip. And, and so there's, there's two examples where, where different routes were chosen. What's, what's your view? Did, did Iceland do the right thing? Did Ireland do the wrong thing? Uh, not that it's so simple, but if you could put those two examples in context, it would be very helpful. So uh, is, I was in, in Reykjavik two weeks ago at a conference, wow. and we had... Uh, Carl Wellen, who was a uh, professor at um, Trinity College, who made this, this comparison and did it very well. And you know, the, the, the joke at the beginning was that there was one letter difference and <laughs> six months in terms of timing. And the notion was that Ireland was in such a better position. And now, as you, as you pointed out, in fact, it's completely the opposite. Iceland is doing fine. You go there, there's no signs of, of, uh, of, of a crisis. People are, are doing fine. They're growing again. They basically cut loose on the banks, let the banks default. And th this, I think, is, is a very good lesson for Europe. They, this bailout route is actually the one that's disaster because they took the government down. The Icelandic government is OK. And I think they're going to come out of it fine. Yeah, two, two points on this. I think the bailout mentality 
has gone perhaps too far, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we need to, you know, think about other ways, right, to, to overcome problems. Of course, the other important issue to keep in mind, just, uh, uh, you know, to make sure that we're on the same page, is that the letter that is different in the two countries' names, of course, that one of them belongs I into the euro zone and the other one had more, which also adds, I think, to the, uh, so Iceland had more policy options at its disposal. But I totally agree with Franklin that they did not make the mistake of thinking that they could bail out banks that were absolutely oversized for the for the uh, for the uh, uh, for what Iceland is. That is to say, they have grown way too big, right, by making essentially loans and taking deposits from outside of the country, right, over the boom years. Actually, I want to close that same loop. The 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 idea of the euro, uh, Iceland didn't have the euro to deal with, and when you talked about the UK doing better and having made some good choices, it too didn't have the euro to deal with. So it didn't have the straitjacket that Portugal, Spain, Greece have in, in that they can't devalue, which would be, of course, the classical way to get yourself out of a, a bad situation. Also, you can make your own decisions mm -hmm. as opposed to having to sit at the table. Yeah. Uh, and also, you don't have to think about what might be the implications of your decisions for 26 other you know, members or, well, in the case of the Euro, 16 other members right, of, the, of the common currency. Uh, so that, that that changes a lot of things, but 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 I think the fact remains that they chose not to bail out the banks, right? And that was a, uh, as as it turns out, was a uh, seems to have been a, a very good uh, decision. And it didn't cause the catastrophe that people are arguing. They they defaulted on the, the bonds, which you know, I, in my view, the Irish should have done long ago, but are now being prevented from doing by the ECB and the EU. So. And, and in Ireland, um, which decided to take over the bad debts of the banks, but the size of those debts, correct me if I'm wrong, aren't the size of those debts a couple times the size of the Irish GDP? I mean, they're, they're, they're huge, and they're the kind of thing that could take decades t yeah. to pay off. And um, Well, I, I, it's a little bit more complicated than because Ireland had essentially a sovereign wealth fund which offset that, so they've already basically spent that money in offsetting some of the debt. So then the issue is how much farther a price is going to fall, which is the, what you were raising for Spain. In, in Ireland, in, if it starts growing again, who knows where, where property prices will go. But th these situations can transform. So it could be very bleak, but also Ireland is a competitive country. They have what levels of GDP per capita were much closer really to the U.S. than to most European countries. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Ireland made it. All right, well, let's try to wrap things up here. We're, we're on the edge of the cliff. We're looking, <laughs> we're looking over, uh, and there's sort of a race going on as to whether the politicians can patch things up before uh, there's a self-fulfilling prophecy of some sort and, and things completely fall apart. Um, Probably there, there's no one in Europe that wants to see that happen. Probably most people in Europe want to see the Eurozone stay together. Um, but these, these pressures are like tectonic plates. Something's got to give. What do you think is most likely to happen um, and over what period? Not to put you on the spot too much, but <laughs> what, I, and, and you can have alternate scenarios, but I, I, I'm curious. Just to keep it simple, I think the Euro European leaders are going to persist uh, you know, in their attempt to, um, uh, you know, fix things by creating, you know, by, by creating this uh, facility, right, this fund uh, with a set of rules there. And uh, the markets are going to maybe partially believe that uh, that's going to work, right? Um, if nothing else gets in the way, maybe it will work. Uh, but some of the underlying problems will, will still be there, right? And uh, as we've been, um, I think, mentioning repeatedly, a key thing is what happens in Italy, right? What happens in Spain also, I think, but uh, because if things take a turn for the worse in either one of those two countries or both, that, that would mean, well, I think immediately that the, the, the current plan wouldn't work, wouldn't be sufficient, right? And um, so I think there's going to be quite a bit of muddling through. Yeah, uh, you know, that would be my, that's my expectation. There's going to be a lot of muddling through because, again, even though outsiders looking to Europe see that several of these countries or the entire, you know, Eurozone is very close to the cliff, 
I don't think that's the perception by the politicians yet, right? That would be my take on, on, on so that. So continued on that question. ability to muddle through somehow, some way. Yeah. Okay. So I would be a little bit more pessimistic than I think that they will continue to try to muddle through. I think, as I say, if, if uh, Italy was to look over the cliff and get its act together, which it can undoubtedly do, has many, many strengths, as a wonderful country in many ways, if they could do that and, and get rid of these political problems that, that are, are at the core of their problems, then then we can move forward and you know th we can hope f for more growth but there is a real risk uh, of some kind of self-fulfilling contagion or some problem which happens too quickly for them to deal with because you know if it happens over a period of weeks then the politicians can say wow you know we're in a terrible situation we've got to raise taxes we've got to do all these things we really need to pull together and come through this, and, th and then they can do it. But, but the real problem is that it may happen too quickly. This is something that can play out in a few days when things go bad quickly, and, and I think that that's the real risk. But hopefully they'll muddle through. I mean, that's what they think is going to happen, but let's hope they're right. And as far as fundamental causes, I mean, one underlying fundamental problem, it seems to me, is, is this huge trade imbalance between the North and the South, and the North is running big trade surpluses with the South, which speaks to the, the lack of competitiveness in the South. How does that get redressed? How, how, how do you solve that? You've, uh, I mean, that is, at, other than, as, as I think we've alluded to, that you, you deflate the Southern economies in a way that means lower wages and, and slower growth for painful austerity measures, in other words. Is, is there some other? Back to the straitjacket, right? I mean, the common currency, essentially, I mean, that's right. one e comment. Exactly. It makes it very difficult for these countries to, uh, right, to uh, rebalance. And, uh, but secondly, of course, um, you know, the immediate concern for politicians and policymakers is how to address all of these, you know, financial problems, right? But uh, medium run, long run, uh, there's more fundamental policies that need to be uh, put in place in order to increase the competitiveness of those, of those countries. I, I mentioned earlier that over the last 10 years, German manufacturing costs have uh, stayed flat, whereas those in the uh, periphery of Europe have increased by 35 to uh, 40 percent over a period of 10 years. And uh, it's not that they're improving, and they're not improving fast enough, it's that actually they're losing ground relative to other countries in the world, and frankly has been mentioned repeatedly that many of these peripheral countries have per capita incomes that are very close, right, to places like Germany or, well, Ireland before the crisis was above the UK's and so on and so forth. Uh, so y you cannot compete, right, uh, you cannot hope to compete in a world in which you're already relatively rich, right, mm -hmm. if you don't make now investments and if you don't uh, introduce policies that will help you improve your productivity and your competitiveness. So it's a very uh, difficult problem. I mean, most of the attention now, I would say, all of the attention is focused on the short-term problem, right? But there's a more fundamental, you know, longer run. And we haven't even talked about the emerging economies here, right? Which is the other issue when it comes to competitiveness. That is to say that it's not just keeping a pace with Germany. It's also that other emerging economies are, you know, growing and uh, they're accumulating skills and, uh, and they're investing in R&D. Unfortunately, Southern Europe is, I think, um, stuck in the middle, right? So they, 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 they're not as good as Germany, and then the emerging economies are getting so much better that uh, I think it's going to be very problematic for them, uh, you know, in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years to negotiate that, uh, that situation. They're, uh, they're caught in the middle, right? I think, you know, we, we're spending a lot on, on economic factors because clearly that's the short-term issue. But, you know, I think we've talked a little bit about this today, but there is, within Europe, fundamental re differences. And you know, there's a reason why the first half of the 20th century, they killed tens of millions of people, each other and all over the world. And, and, you know, it, we've made so much progress since then from, from the First World War and the Second World War. But there still are huge differences, both, you know, we, you, we've been talking about them, but just the way people think about the world and the way they think about the work-life balance. You know, in Northern Europe, 
there's not much to do <laughs> except work. If you live in Spain or Italy, there's a lot to do, and you can go enjoy family, go and to the beach, take the whole of August off. This, you know, there's not much point in doing that if you live in in the UK, for example, because it rains all the time. But but you know, these are these are fundamental differences. But the institutions are, are just very different. The, the social compacts between the rich and the poor, how the societies run, the view of things like whether you should pay your taxes. These are all Absolutely. very big differences. And my own view is that probably the Eurozone in its current form is a jump too far. What Europe needs to do is just spend another 20, 30 years, grow together, get a common view of the world, because Europeans focus on their differences, but you know if you compare their, them with the Chinese or they're so similar where you basically use the, si the same alphabet in 80% of the continent. The other part, it's not that much difference. The languages are not that far apart. The cultures are very similar in many, many ways. And the things that they killed each other over for hundreds of years, like the difference between Catholics and Protestant, these are not very big in the big scheme of things. And I think they just need to realize that and grow together. And then they can start having much more integration. You've talked in the past about the idea, I haven't heard much about it lately, but the idea of having a two-speed euro where there, there would be a, a different level for southern countries uh, than, than for northern countries. Is that one way to help to bridge this gap? Some, one way or another, I think we'll probably move to that, whether that means Greece and Italy leave the Eurozone or whether there's some other kind of breakup. But as I say, unless we have some changes of the kind we've talked, I, I, it's difficult to see the Eurozone in its current form lasting that much longer. Something's got to change dramatically, in my view. Yeah, and so far, the politicians are thinking about more integration, but mm -hmm. of course, they, they cannot agree as to what that would be. So they're trying to essentially, you know, escape from the current situation by, you know, intensifying the, uh, you know, deepening the union. But uh, precisely when you attempt to do that, that's when all of the differences, the relevant differences, reemerge, right? So that's very much the German view. What the German yeah. view is, you all become like us in Germany and everybody right. be fine because nobody right. run deficits right. and all those kinds of things, but they don't think about that in the rest of Europe. So, so what would the likely effects be on the US and the world economy um, if we have something catastrophic happen in Europe? Uh, or if there is a muddle through outcome? I'd like to ask each of you. Are we talking about another global event like 2008 at a minimum? Yes, I think at, at, at a minimum it's that kind of event. With the situation being such that governments can't step in. So, uh, you know, for example, what would happen in the U.S. if we started having problems in the banking system I find it very difficult to believe that Congress would pass any kind of major funding of buyouts of banks, which would mean that the Fed would have to do it, but that also they're coming under political pressure too. So it, it's a very worrying situation globally. And, and this, of course, is why the other leaders keep calling the European lead, the, the continental European, and saying, you've got to do something about it, because otherwise we're all going to be in trouble. And it, it is ex ex extremely worrying. Mm -hmm. Also, on the on the side of the real economy, I mean, still Europe is a very large market. It is a very important market for American firms. And uh, keep in mind that many of them now are actually um, reporting very large profits because they're making because they sti they're still making money in Europe. And with the euro being so strong relative to the dollar, you know, they can report in dollar terms like uh, outsized uh, profits, uh, especially uh, consumer goods companies, American consumer goods Helps companies. Helps make their goods competitive. Absolutely. So, uh, so if uh, if uh, Europe were to implode, uh, there would be a financial effect that would you know reverberate around the world. But also, you know, again, um, a lot of American firms right now they're making very good money in Europe, and uh, that could uh, you know disappear. 
Isn't it true that China sells more to Europe than it does to the U.S.? So obviously a huge effect for China. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons that they're having a lot of problems at the moment. So I think they're very worried about that. And uh, isn't it the case that China has been helping a little bit here? And can we expect that they may, out of self-interest, offer additional help? My own view is they may offer a little, but they'll, they'll ask for something in return. And I don't think we've got to that point yet where that, that it's clear what, what the trade would be. I mean, the Chinese are certainly at this point not interested in buying European debt, right? <laughs> I mean, they, you know, who would like to, to do that? Obviously, I think they have a keen interest in buying other types of assets, especially assets linked to production or distribution. Uh, but as you know, uh, each time that a major Chinese company wants to buy something in Europe or the United States, all of the alarms could go off, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so the Chinese would, would be very much like to, uh, you know, invest money, pour money, but I don't think they would, you know, go for uh, government securities. They, they would like to pursue other, other ways of helping. Uh, but I don't think uh, Europe is ready, and for that matter, I don't think the U.S. is ready for that either right now. So let me ask each of you to sum up the discussion today and what you see happening going forward. Mara, would you well, like on, the, um, uh, on the optimistic side of things, um, uh, you know, I think that uh, the uh, eventually enough pressure will build up on European decision makers uh, uh, so that they, you know, take action uh, to, uh, you know, com you know in, in terms of coming up with a with something that is credible, right? as to how to deal with the Greek tragedy, right, and how to deal with the other, the other issues. Uh, we've also discussed, uh, you know, bigger problems in bigger economies that uh, could have bigger consequences, right, for, for not just Europe, but, but also the rest of the world. Whatever happens in Italy today or tomorrow uh, with this potential no-confidence vote on Berlusconi or just that his government collapses due to lack of parliamentary support, I think could be a turning point. Uh, whether it's a turning point for the you know, for the better or for the worse, uh, that remains to be seen. In part, it remains, you know, it depends on who is the new prime minister and what kind of a coalition he or she, he most likely, is able to, uh, to build and what kind of, uh, you know, support they get in terms of pushing austerity measures, right? So that's, that's really, really important. And by way of summary, I think it's also important to keep in mind that, that this is not just a European problem. So we just talked about that. Uh, this truly is, I think, a global problem. Uh, you need to let the Europeans figure it out. But I think any help that other, you know, important players in the world can offer uh, in terms of encouraging them to address the issues is very important because um, if a catastrophe actually materializes in Europe, that's going to reduce everybody's standards of living in the short run. And it's going to cause a lot of problems financially around the world. So I think it's very important not to, um, you know, think that uh, if the European, something happens to Europe, oh, that's going to be better for us because then, you know, hey, we can say that we're in better shape. Uh, than them. It's going to come back to haunt us uh, very quickly, in fact. So I, I would agree with what Morrow said. I, you know, I think hopefully they'll muddle through. That they've, they've done it a lot now. It's quite likely that'll continue for a while. But there are, there are these downside risks. I, I think the real focus now is on Italy. One of the very encouraging things over the last few weeks is that whereas previously there was complete denial that there was anything of a problem in Italy, that's now really become the center of attention within Europe. And hopefully they can sort that out. There are many other problems around the world. I think it's very important we don't forget that our own soap opera is just about to start up again. We're now, what, 28, or 28 days from the November 23rd deadline when we're supposed to have these cuts in place. That doesn't seem to be going well, is my understanding. And then we have, uh, um, difficult to believe given how much we see politicians <laughs> on the television at the moment, but we've now got another year to the next election, which is going to be full-time politics. And it's in many ways a lot of the same issues about how much money should we spend, what's the role of the government, how much debt should we have. So these are problems that are big. It's not just Europe. It's many places in the world. We shouldn't forget our own problems. Thank you very much for this discussion. And maybe we can follow up and see where things are 
in a couple months or so. Okay. Thank you.